95% of digital transformation projects in, in banks fail. That's a well-known fact. The problem with digital transformation is you're trying to take the existing business processes and technology workloads and move them to the cloud. Right? And it's all about cost cutting and efficiency at massive scale, but it fails. Welcome everyone to another episode of Banking on Air. And today I have the pleasure of welcoming Martin McCann from Trade Ledger. Welcome, Martin. Thank you, uh, Marcel. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for accepting this invite. We've been planning this for quite some time. I'm so happy that we, we finally managed to do this. So Martin, can you give the audience a, a brief introduction of who you are, your background and Trade Ledger? Yeah, absolutely. So Trade Ledger is an enterprise software company. We have global operations where we provide an enterprise grade lend tech or lending technology platform to the banking sector. So we're sometimes called a fintech, but we're more accurately an enterprise SaaS company would be our categorization. Uh, and basically we provide next generation technology to banks to enable them to lend completely digitally to businesses. And we, we tend to specialize on banks and non-banks or alternative lenders who service the SME sector globally. And we service every country in the world with the exception of China. So your primary market for this are SMEs. This wouldn't be retail banking. Is that right? Yeah, so it's, it's business and commercial banking. So our clients are the banks and their clients are the SMEs. The SME would apply for credit from the bank using our technology. What drove you to build Trade Ledger? Was this something that you dreamt about as a little kid that you'll be building this? Or how, how did you get to the point where you started building Trade Ledger? ledger and you realize this is really something that the market needs well marcel i don't think anybody ever dreams of building banking technology as a kid so that wasn't it it really came from i guess i saw once in a generation convergence of what was going on in the technology and banking sectors and really this has been coming since the age of the internet which is changing all aspects of banking it's just coming to business banking and lending and business banking slower than it has in retail and and consumer lending so really where it started from is I've been an enterprise technologist my, my entire career, so 20 years of building tech companies in, in various different guises. The last 10 years before I joined, I started the company in 2016 with my co-founder, Matt. I was at SAP, the, the large German software company, in fact, Europe's largest uh, enterprise software company, where I specialized in growing new emerging solutions businesses within the group globally. Uh, and really, that, that's where the idea of Trade Ledger started from. I, I was responsible for the business network solutions group in Asia Pacific. I was living in Sydney at the time. And I, I could see that there was an opportunity and a challenge in trying to connect the idea of provisioning banking services for businesses into the supply chains in which those businesses operated so that businesses shouldn't have to disconnect from the value they're creating in their supply chain to go and get the banking services that they wanted. That concept now is becoming known as embedded finance. So essentially, it's using data from the supply chain in order to drive a completely digital business banking proposition for the business to operate in those supply chains. And my view at that point in time, even though I didn't know a lot about business banking, was that everything seemed to be in place for the, the lending market in business banking to be disrupted by better data about customers, which could redefine onboarding credit models, decisioning models, servicing of the products, uh, etc. And the technology I knew from what I'd been doing my whole career was definitely enterprise grade enough to be able to support uh, complete new models of how you actually provide lending and value add around lending and other advisory type services, treasury, cash flow and liquidity analysis to those businesses in conjunction with the, the credit that they needed. So, so that was really the beginning of it. I then solidified that thinking. I started doing research into it when I left SAP. And as with all the best ideas, where it really came to life was in a pub one night in Sydney, where I, I recruited my co-founder, Matt, who's the CTO, or Dr. Matthias Bourne, as he's otherwise known. He's, he's got a PhD in business information systems, also worked at SAP. And by the end of the night and several pints of beer, we'd convinced ourselves that we could build a global category leader in a new emerging sector, which is becoming known as Lend Tech or Lending as a Service. That was in the uh, second half of 2016. And now it's 2020. I now live on the other side of the world where we set up the global headquarters of Trade Ledger in London. This has been four years in the making, really coming from the very 
basic idea that came into your head and transforming it into the technology that you have today. So what is it that it can do today and what's the big vision for the next few years? Yeah, it's been quite a whirlwind over the, the last four years. We've really built a complete end lending platform. Some banks would consider like a next generation technology platform, which enables them for the first time to effectively have one piece of technology that manages the entire life cycle of credit for business customers. So that's everything from initial contact point to application through to onboarding, credit assessment, decisioning, documentation creation, fulfillment of the product, through to drawdowns, servicing and management of the product and reconciliation and closeout. Typically, before a trade ledger, a bank would need between six and eight systems to do that. Those six or eight systems would average in age between 15 years old and 40 years old. More of them on the 40-year-old side, the, the bigger the bank got. And as well as that, those eight systems would need connections to multiple back office and core banking systems as well to operate, which explains why it took 90 days to complete a lending product journey from start to finish for the customer, 30 hours of work by the customer, 100 hours of work across five departments in the bank. It's an absolute nightmare. When I look at the stats of what the status quo is in business lending in big banks today, I think of it as the banking sector that the internet forgot about. Yes. And on top of that, like I was just recently speaking to the CTO of a Central European bank. And what he told me was many of the bottlenecks in his systems, although many of them are purely technological, even more tend to be the ones where you're almost interfacing between two systems and there isn't a technology interface, it's a human interface. So somebody actually literally needs to pick up a piece of paper and move it somewhere else. Or somebody needs to approve something that is actually printed out, like an actual contract or something. So that was actually very surprising to me because the amount of ineffectiveness that introduces into the system is, is horrible. It, as you said, it takes a month or two to complete something that should take days or hours sometimes. I think the big question really is if we're at where we were 20 or 30 years ago to where we're now, where everybody's still talking about what they call digital transformation. Every other conference, especially now during COVID, like a, a piece on digital transformation. So when somebody tells you we're going through a digital transformation, transformation project at our bank, or we want to digitally transform our institution. What do you think about it? What, what comes to mind for you? That you're going to fail. 95% of digital transformation projects in, in banks fail. That's a well-known fact. And it's digital transformation is not the objective or the outcome that you're looking for. D digital customer experience is, is where you need to be focusing in. So you're not looking to digitize things you've done before. And, and the problem with digital transformation is you're trying to take the existing business processes and technology workloads and move them to the cloud. Right? And it's all about cost cutting and efficiency at massive scale, but it fails ultimately. What you need to be doing is, is creating, uh, completely reimagining what the digital data that exists today in, in the ecosystem you operate in will enable in terms of new ways of thinking about convenient frictionless value add for your customers. If you take an example of that, uh, I mentioned some of the stats around the current business lending scenarios we see, so 30 hours of work, 90 days from start to finish for the process for the customer. The customers who use our platform are typically seeing the application process taking four minutes as opposed to two to six weeks from start to finish. Typically, there'd be in the region of 200 pages of paper in that two to six week period, zero paper, not one sheet of paper. All the data is basically collected via API digitally from the customer systems or environment. Then the amount of work then goes down significantly to the point where this can be done on a mobile phone while you're having a cup of coffee. And that's the kind of frictionless experience that uh, you need to be creating. So th the problem with banks is that they don't really have the right starting point and they don't have all of the capabilities they need to really compete in the sort of the digital era. So specifically what we find with the banks that we're talking to is they always start with the assumption that this is a process re-engineering exercise, and it's not. If you process re-engineer as your core objective of transformation, all you'll end up with is a slightly more efficient version of the same business. This is a massive disruption cycle. It's the biggest disruption of banking business models since the introduction of the ATM. Just playing around the edges with process re-engineering is not going to fix them. You need to start with understanding what digital information assets you can get access to in the marketplace via APIs, which are becoming pervasive in all banking models. And you need to understand what enterprise technology capabilities are available for you to think about 
different ways to create better customer experiences, more value and frictionless engagement channels for your customers. And that's where the banks are going wrong. They're not starting in the right place by asking those questions. And the skill sets that they have in the business typically are not trained in that type of sort of frictionless customer experience in a digital environment. So to put it very simply, they're basically just taking what used to be a paper form. Eventually that became a digital form, but they're not asking the question, why is there even a form in the first place? They're asking, how do we make the form efficient? That's correct. You should be in banking, Marcel. Should I? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's absolutely correct. You've identified the, the, the problem correctly. And of course, it's not all the, the, the bank's fault. This is the most heavily regulated uh, industry in the world, and rightfully. But the, the, the level of regulation has gotten to the point where it's impacting with the, the industry's uh, ability to reinvent itself post this inflection point in the marketplace. And we're starting to see the whole sector fragment. And we're starting to see alternate flows of uh, funding and finance going into the business sector outside of banking, because banking is working at an extreme disadvantage by having to do everything within this highly regulated environment, which of course is the opposite of what you need for agile change in a digital environment. Sure, but I, I guess you're an example of a company that, even in this regulated space, is still able to innovate and really bring that down from weeks to minutes. So yes, it, it can't purely be put on the regulation, right? Yeah, it's not all on the regulation, but we're not a bank, uh, and we're, we're the partner for the bank who can actually provide them with that digital capability, tech, and transformational capabilities and, and, and advisory that they need. That's exactly why we exist is because it's so hard for the banks to do this from within. So this might be a completely naive question, but why have banks been so resistant to this sort of cloud driven or, or very much decentralized way of building software where you're really building it in an agile way that can be deployed very quickly into the cloud. Has this been purely regulation or have there been other barriers that have been prevented? It's mostly been risk and regulation. Uh, that's been the biggest problem. If you look at the risk models in business banking, most of them date back 20 or 30 years. So most of the banks that we look at are still using the same risk models today that were developed in the 90s. So that's one problem. There's a much broader range of information available to create new risk controls. But that's quite difficult for, for banks to do because everything they do has got to go through extreme scrutiny by the regulator. And they don't necessarily think that the, the regulator will understand the type of innovation that they're bringing in. And they may see it as, as more risk which impacts their RWA ratios and their capital efficiency. So it's, it's very difficult for them to do that type of change within this in environment. But I also think as well that the skills that made banks large scale and successful up to this point are still the prevalent skills which bankers have today. And they're not the skills which are required in this post-inflection market for, for digital banking. And we're starting to see examples come from outside of banking, which banking can learn from in order to accelerate the adoption of digitization in, in the sector. So if you look at China, some of the most digital alternate finance markets are to be found there. But if you also look at here in the UK, it's got one of the highest adoption of alternate finance market penetration in the world. It's over 15% and growing. And that's as a, a direct uh, result of the, the regulator here trying to stimulate further competition to the big banks. And, and then there's the spirit of entrepreneurialism. When you've got new assets like uh, new technology, new digital data, access via APIs through things like open banking and PSD2 in Europe, which actually regulates that Banks have to open up their customer data sets to third parties if the customer provides permission. That creates a huge uh, new type of value creation wave, which banking has not seen before. And I think we're starting to see the law of unintended consequences where innovations are actually happening outside of banking, that banking can either copy buy or come up with an alternate version for their own sector. And yet, we often hear that banks, when they actually want to go through this change, they start talking to consulting companies to help them build out those projects. Yes. What do you think about that? Is, is that the, the solution to, to fixing this? I think consulting and services partners are part of the solution. But where a lot of banks go, go wrong is they, they almost outsource the problem to the consultants and ask them for a solution. Using skilled external consultants in order to plug your skills gap is a great idea. Asking a, a consulting firm to come in and take care of your future strategy and deliver it is, is a more problematic position to be in. My personal view is that we're probably uh, too far on the side of the line of over-reliance on consultants in a lot of areas of banking. But we also still have huge gaps in terms of 
the digital transformation skills that are required in banks. There's no reason why consultants can't provide the skills to close those gaps, but they need to be used in the right way. What would you suggest to a bank that they've now realized that, let's go with a bank that would use Trade Ledger to solve their problems. What would you suggest would be the first steps that they take when they realize that we have a problem where everything's taking too long. We need six different systems to achieve deciding on whether we want to give a loan or not. What would you suggest to a bank like that? Where do they start this transformation project that isn't just for the sake of digital transformation, but rather to actually move forward? So I'd start with what are the business outcomes you want to get? The number of bank executives we've spoken to and said, we just want to digitize our back office. Why? What's the benefit? What are the objectives you're trying to get? And t- typically we find there's three objectives largely that banks need to address one or more of. Either they're trying to create cost efficiencies because the paper-based approach that they're using and the multiple systems that need servicing requires a huge overhead and it's very hard to make money and profit in, in the lending sector for that reason. So a lot of lenders are not profitable because uh, of the inefficiencies of that are baked into the model. Not all to do with operations, some of it to do with capital costs as well and the structure of the capital markets. The other type of business outcome they could be looking to get is, is growth. So most banks have uh, lending books which are reasonably large in terms of scale and they struggle to grow. A typical scenario would be with your best efforts, you can grow the book by 10% a year but your attrition can be 15% a year. It's really hard just to keep your book the same size. It's a zero-sum game for most of these banks. And you need to think about a a new type of frictionless customer experience and new value-add methods in order to change that zero-sum game. But actually, the the most frequent reason why banks are doing this is fear. It's a fear of big tech and disintermediation of their customer base by big tech. And it's quite interesting. You see a lot of announcements, which on the face of them, don't seem to make any sense, but are going to have a big impact. So you see some of the big banks coming out with digital wallets and coming out with transaction banking services, which are embedded in technology company services. So Google has an an e-wallet capability, which is supplied by, I think, Citibank. Probably the most famous example is in the the retail space, where uh, you can now get an Apple credit card. It's not actually provided by Apple, it's provided by another bank. And this is the thing which is driving most of the investment in digitization, as the banks call it, in in my view. They, They realize that if they don't look to create more value in this digital environment, that they will just become irrelevant to large sectors of their customer base over time. So in, in the example you just used, that's the embedded finance that you talked about a little bit earlier. This is the sort of hiding of financial services within products that you traditionally not find financial services in and really baking them into the whole process. You also mentioned the sort of the PSD2 driven innovation potentially happening in Europe. Is that something that you and Trade Ledger are also part of or is that not yet part of what PSD2 means? Uh, Certainly. So what we've done is we've basically pioneered the concept of data driven lending which encapsulates the opportunities that PSD2 and open banking data provide across Europe. So today, look at the scenario. You want to do a risk assessment on a company for lending purposes or credit assessment purposes. You have to get a copy of the statutory accounts. You got to get an updated version of the management accounts. You got to get a bureau credit rating and you got to get all of the bank transaction uh, data for the last 12 months so you can reconcile and test that the accounts are correct and see what movements have been since the last updates in the accounts, all before you start doing the credit assessment. That's a lot of work. What we actually do is we can now get a an automatic data feed of all of the bank transaction data, an automatic data feed from the, the customer's accounting system, and an automatic credit score assessment from the bureau service. And we can also get automatic logistics information on the, the movement of all of the inventory and finished goods and services of the customer. So what used to take between two and six weeks just to start doing the credit assessment, we can complete the whole process from start to finish in under one hour with no paper. And part of that is open banking in itself is not the end game. Open banking is basically a new value enabler. So having that stream of bank transaction data enables us to come up with a new frictionless version of a lending product experience, which you can do literally from your mobile phone while having a cup of coffee, which would have been unthinkable before uh, PSD2 and API accessible accounting systems. This is really just circling back to what we spoke a little earlier. This is all driven by the rise of the internet, right? This is the, the this all started when banks were no longer living in the world of the nine to five, where at nine o'clock they open, at five o'clock they close, and then they did all
all the calculations that they needed to do overnight. Now we actually expect all banks to be online all the time and really be available to users all the time. So my next question is, we often talk about deploying to the cloud, moving things into the cloud so that they are accessible to all very quickly instead of being in these proprietary data centers that you need to build complex connections into. But we're now also hearing the term cloud native. How do you see the difference between cloud native and when banks say they're just going to the cloud? Moving to the cloud is really about moving your infrastructure and your your technology workloads to the cloud. That's basically moving away from your own purpose-built and maintained infrastructure and hardware, which is is purpose-built and managed by your internal teams, to actually putting all that on a third-party data center and just consuming that hardware as, as a service, essentially. What you're doing is you're taking out the entire infrastructure layer that you have as a dedicated infrastructure, which is very expensive, and you need a lot more capacity than you actually use most of the time to deal with peak loads. And you're moving that into typically either a dedicated or a multi-tenanted data center, essentially. And the three large ones being AWS, Google Cloud, and and Azure. So that's really an efficiency play. That's about getting uh, better utilization of the infrastructure assets and thereby driving down the unit cost of the infrastructure. That doesn't do anything to transform the business or the customer experience for you. The difference about being cloud native is you actually have designed a business model which can only operate because of the experiences, the data and the technology which exists because of cloud services. The real benefit of early winning examples of use cases from open banking is around uh, reconciliation and categorization of information. Everybody listening will have the example of looking at a bank statement and going, what the hell is that? You get a transaction code, you get a number, and you get some kind of a, a vendor or a merchant name, which bears no resemblance to anywhere you've ever been, as far as you can remember. What you can do with the cloud services perspective is not just try to get that from point A to point B, which is the equivalent of moving a workload, But actually what you can do is you can enrich that. You can actually provide some categorization service on top of it, which decodes the codes, gives you natural language and tells you a lot more data. So you can actually say, this business is located in this point. Here's the address of the business. Here's the real name of the business. And by connecting to your mobile phone, we can tell you how many times you visited that business in the last month. These are all things which which really help to make it easier for people to understand how to manage their finance in this particular case. And that's exactly the same with business finance. We provide the concept of virtual CFO, which does exactly the same for cash flow, treasury, and and liquidity perspectives for businesses. Because we analyze your accounts, we can tell you things about how you baseline in terms of financial health with regard to cash flow and liquidity against other peers in your industry or in your region. And we can also tell you things like if there's opportunities for you to invest cash short term, if there's better FX rates you could be getting for the international deals you're doing, because we can benchmark all of our data across the customer base that we deal with. So that, that's the idea of coming up with value adding services, which are only available if you have a cloud native model or, or strategy. It's about reinventing the business process and coming up with better ways of adding value and adding more value. Right. And simply put, really, the legacy banks or the existing technology that is there, all of that is fragmented. That's in many different systems. So actually, if you even just want to get the information, that just takes time. And you might need approval from specific areas. And it's that sort of like this continuous process of trying to bring all the information closer, but at the same time, really at high speed so that you can get not only to the information, but get that information back to the customer when you make that decision. That absolutely makes sense. The reason why we're even speaking and the reason we know each other is that you actually trusted us at Vacuum Labs to help you out on this journey and in building out your technology. We've built stuff in the cloud for, for the past eight years and this and especially in financial services. So this has really been what we do and what we do best. So my sort of big question is when you were looking at the landscape of various providers that could help you in your journey, why did you choose Vacuum Labs and what has been the benefit for you so far? Okay, so I'll start by answering the question why we look to use a partner in the first place, and then I'll see how we ended up selecting Vacuum Labs. Because we are a technology company, building software is our core competency. And just 12 months ago, it never occurred to us that we would actually use like an outsource provider of, uh, of software development. But the reality dawned on us at the beginning of this year that our business was growing faster than we could grow our technology operation organically. Uh, and we were starting to experience growing pains because we were growing the, the, the technology faster than we could reorganize for the the larger scale. So so we decided the only way to solve this problem was to bring in like a midterm partner who we could basically use to 
accentuate and expand our capability so that we could keep up with the growth of the market opportunity that we were servicing in a sort of lend tech for business lending. So alongside building out our own teams, we figured out what would be the easiest areas of development to utilize a third party partner for and what were the things were important for us from a partner. And we're probably the most skeptical people you're ever going to find. Our core expertise is enterprise technology development. Our starting point was it's impossible to outsource any of this development. And we don't believe we have outsourced it. We believe we find a partner who accentuates what we do and gives us more capacity as we grow the business. We went through a very rigorous assessment process. We were looking for a partner who had the uh, attributes of uh, expertise in technology, who could comply with the high enterprise standards that we build to, had the understanding of long-term architecture and technology trends to make sure that we were building was going to be future-proof, and uh, that also had the right values to actually work uh, alongside and as uh, an integral part of our team. And that was key to our success of working with, with Vacuum Labs. We consider Vacuum Labs as part of our team. We don't consider you as a third party. And I think the values that we have as an organization, we saw reflected uh, in the evaluation process in the people that we encountered. And that gave us a lot of confidence that the Vacuum Labs teams are just like us. You're just like a bunch of people with the same values and ethics, have the same level of geekiness about uh, finding the most elegant ways to architect and build better solutions. And in some areas, you actually had more experience of building certain types of financial services, technology solutions than we had. And that's how we selected which areas... uh, we could start to collaborate with you on and we selected areas and components of the solution that we wanted to build that we were never going to get to in the next six to nine months where we thought you had deep expertise uh, and we started there Uh, and it's worked extremely well we always expected to have some problems and of course there were some problems but there was also a willingness to own those problems and be transparent that there was issues in the early days and as we worked through a couple of cycles we got quicker and quicker of identifying where these issues were coming from and solving them Um, and very quickly we landed on a spot where this just became business as normal for us we've got a very strong relationship and we find the team uh, very responsive and very easy to deal with and as a result of the vacuum lab squad it's just another squad it's just the name happens to be vacuum lab has become an indispensable part of our team for the midterm as we continue to, to grow to keep up with the demands of the market. Well, thank you, Martin. One thing that you really touched on that I think our team really enjoys is the fact that we can work in those cycles. There are often people that we are talking to that we might work together, partner with, or be a vendor for, and not having the ability to go in these sort of, whether it is very strict scrum or not, like having these sort of sprint-like structures where we have the constant ability to ask for feedback from you and likewise you can ask feedback from us and there's that constant loop where instead of having this big project to deliver at the end which is what many people are used to there's these cycles that we can go through which deliver partial solutions and then over time you might not know in week one where you actually want to end up in week 12 because some things become clear as you develop i think the biggest problem we have with uh, with vacuum labs at the minute is we've overrun our budget that i'd agreed with our cfo when we set out the project because we've been using you to plug gaps as the business grows we've been relying on you more and more so i'm getting a hard time from my CFO that we've over- overshot the resource allocation that we originally set out to do, which is a good sign because it shows that the, the solution is is working for us. Oh, we're super happy that we can be there to, to help you with that because it's always good to have someone to, to lean on. Martin, as you move forward, as, as you look into the next few years, how do you see your company growing? Is this a, a global growth across many different markets? You're already operating globally, but is this a global growth? Or are you going to be focusing on either specific verticals or specific specific markets as you move forward? Yeah, so I think we're, we're very narrow and deep in terms of the solution that we provide and hugely scalable. That's, that's the fundamentals of our, our unit economics. So Matt and I, we set out in, in a pub in, in 2016 in Sydney. Our intention was always to be the global number one player in an emerging sector, which hadn't even been named at that point in time, which is becoming known as lending as a service. And within that, we do lending as a service for business finance providers. So so for us, it's basically run harder and faster. We've got the fundamentals of a fantastic product. We believe, obviously I'm biased, but we believe we have the best architecture and, and enterprise technology in the world for this sector. It's the only one that's been built from the ground up by an enterprise technology team, specifically to service just this sector in our view from what we can 
consistency. And we've built out uh, some initial phenomenal attraction. So if you look at the customers that we have, we already have global or multi-country rollouts happening or already happened with more than one of the world's top three trade banks. In parallel, we also have an increasing number of what we call volume customers who are smaller, often alternative lender non-bank customers who roll out very quickly, but with much smaller volumes, obviously, typically in a single country. So for us, we were always determined to be the global number one by the end of 2021. And that's still our objective. Now, whether we make it by the end of 2021 or sometime in 2022, I don't really care, but that's always the objective number one in the sector. We want to be the sector category creator and leader. That was always the plan. For us, we found that our niche geographically is that East-West trade corridor. So uh, it's banks and non-banks who basically provide financing for domestic and trade import-export from Europe all the way through to China. And from our perspective, we can support them in every country that they operate in. And that, again, gives us a unique differentiation. Because of the cloud-native sort of services nature of our business, we can be up and running in any country which has an AWS Prime site in about four hours. That's how easy it is that the product has been designed to be uh, multi-language, multi-currency, and easy to localize to those countries. That's just what we do as enterprise technologists. So for us, uh, global domination is, is a summary of where we want to get to by the end of next year. Our category is starting to become very competitive. It's growing very fast, and uh, we're in the front of the wave. We think we're in great shape to continue growing and to realize our ambition to be the number one player in lending as a service for business finance. Beautiful. So if, if there's a bank right now that is hearing this and they're saying, I need this trade ledger, this is something that we've been dealing with these legacy systems, it's a pain for us, everything takes so much longer, we're losing customers to people who can do it faster than us or, or provide feedback quicker, what should they do? Should they reach out to you or who, what's the best way to begin working? The best thing is to go to our website, tradeledger.io, download our latest uh, white paper, data-driven lending, and get in contact with us. Depending on which country you're in, we've got offices currently in Australia and in the UK. We'll be opening offices in Asia in the next year. Eventually, we'll get into North America. We do have a customer deployment going on in North America at the moment, but we don't have operations there yet. Uh, which is not a prerequisite for dealing with a bank. But the easiest way is, regardless of which country, and just get on the website, understand a little bit more about what we do and its fit with what you want to get as business outcomes with this type of technology. And if it seems to fit what you're looking for and you want more information, just contact us, drop us your details through the website and somebody will be in contact with you the, the following day. Beautiful. Thank you. And so once again, Martin, thank you so much for joining us here today on Banking on Air. It's been an interesting conversation. I'm really curious how you're going to dominate the world globally globally, how you're going to grow. And I look forward to working with you as Vacuum Labs to help you along that journey as that partner supporting you and, and guiding you. Thank you, Marcel. It's, it's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you for, for inviting me along to talk about my, my favorite topic, Trade Ledger. And also thank you to you and, and the extended Vacuum Labs team for the fantastic support that you've been providing us and for being part of our, our journey to, to be number one in our, in our category. Thank you, Martin. Have a wonderful day. You too.